Isaiah chapter 57, if you'd find that please, Isaiah chapter 57, and uh, Lord willing we will resume our study in 2 Timothy next week, but with so many troubling things going on in our country as we near what many consider, and I agree, to be one of the most consequential presidential elections in our nation's history, the basic choice is, do you want to keep America as we've known it? Or do you want a revolution toward socialism? Amen. That's a pretty clear-cut choice, isn't it? Uh, because of all that's going on, I'm just compelled to give at least one message to address it in a biblical and hopefully encouraging way. I don't think it's proper. I don't think it's good for a pastor to week after week emphasize current events and politics. But I also don't think it's good to ignore it either. Politics affects our, our life each day. And the Word of God should impact how we think about everything. Not just Bible study on Sunday, but how we live each and every day, including even how we vote. Now, how we study the Bible makes a big difference in how we view these matters. Dispensational truth is very practical. You know, despite what many in the professing church think because of their failure to rightly divide the word of truth, we're not here to change the world, and we're not here to bring in God's kingdom. God doesn't need our help doing that. The right view in understanding the times and understanding how things are and gaining this understanding from the Word of God is Satan is the prince of this world. He is the God of this world. He is in the politics and the religions. This is, as Paul said in Galatians 1, a present evil world. There will be no real and lasting peace on this earth until the Prince of Peace comes and sets up his righteous kingdom. And Isaiah 57, verse 20. But the wicked are like the troubled sea. You want to know why everything is so chaotic? And we're in tumultuous times? Well, it's been that way a long time. The problem is the wickedness of man. The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest. Whose waters cast up mire and dirt. Just watch the news and this verse is clear to you. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Now that's repeated twice in Isaiah. He said it in chapter 48, verse 22. Let's go back to Isaiah 9. Just run a few references here. The Bible has so much to say about the second coming of Christ. And all the prophecies about His first coming were fulfilled literally. So you know what? All the prophecies about His second coming will also be fulfilled literally. When He was born, the angels said, Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill toward man. Well, what happened? Israel failed to give glory to God in the highest. Israel is God's nation that He'll use to set up His kingdom. They rejected he came unto his own, his own received him not. They rejected their Messiah. Didn't catch him off guard. He knew they would do that. And he had a plan, a hidden purpose, a secret, a mystery to usher in this age we're living in in which he's building the church, the body of Christ. But he will turn back to Israel. He will finish what he started with Israel. He will bring them through tribulation and save them at the second coming. And he will literally set up his kingdom. You've got to understand the times. You've got to, understanding, you've got to understand where we're living in God's plan for the ages. So in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, For unto us a child is born. It's alright to read these verses in October. We don't have to wait till December 25th. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That's humanity and deity. The child born, Christ took on flesh, became a man, but he was given the Son of God, left heaven to come into this world, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, his authority, his power to rule. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, 
the everlasting father. How about, how about that? The child that was born, the son that was given, is the mighty God. He is the everlasting father. Jesus Christ is God. The prince of peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. You know, this world's going to come to an end. But that's fine, it needs to. But when it comes to an end, there's a world to come, spoken of in prophecy. When Christ sets up his kingdom, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, upon, the, upon his kingdom, to order it, to establish it with judgment, and with justice from henceforth even forever. And there's going to be a whole lot of opposition to it. But guess what? The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Nobody going to stop it. Satan ain't going to stop it. The world, the heathen rage, they imagine a vain thing. They set themselves against the Lord and His anointed. But it's going to happen. Okay? It's going to happen. Look in chapter um, 32, Isaiah 32. Isaiah 32, verse 1. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness. That hadn't happened yet, <laughs> but it will. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And princes shall rule in judgment. Now skip down to verse 17. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. That's a good verse to define peace. It's a quietness and assurance forever. So that hadn't happened yet, but I guarantee you it's going to. Okay, the Lord's coming. And He's going to bring a destructive end to this world system. There's going to be a false peace that comes in under the Antichrist. Uh, but it, 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 then, he'll, then the Antichrist is going to break his covenant with Israel. He's going to try to destroy Israel. It's going to be a disaster. But the Lord is going to come, wipe out his enemies, save his nation, set up his kingdom. It's all going to happen just like the Word of God says. Well... That's in the future. In the meantime, in the meantime, in this present age of grace, we're living in a mystery that God planned before the world began, but kept it a secret. He revealed it after the fall of Israel. He interrupted prophecy concerning Israel. We're living in an age, a present age of grace, in which what God is not at war with the world right now. Okay? He will be. He will bring war. But right now, he is demonstrating his amazing long-suffering and his mercy and his grace. And what he's doing, he's offering peace to all individuals who will trust in him. All right, look over in Romans chapter 5. See, there is no peace to the wicked. There is no peace without righteousness. Okay? There's not a righteous kingdom on the earth. America, I, I'd rather live here than anywhere, but it's not, it's not a righteous kingdom nation in the truest sense of the word we have every nation has flaws every nation has failures but there's coming a righteous kingdom there's coming a righteous kingdom on the basis of which will come finally world peace man can't do it the united nations are trying to bring in a kingdom of peace without god and against god and uh, it's anti christ United Nations, I mean, really, UN, what does that mean? It ought to stand for the United Nuts or the usual nonsense or a lot of other things. But wars have only increased since they came on the scene. But look in Romans chapter 5. Romans, I'm laying some groundwork, then I'm going to get very practical about voting and so forth. Uh, I'm not worried about losing 501c3. We don't have it. <laughs> and if we did, I wouldn't worry about it anyway. <laughs> Um, Romans chapter 5, verse number 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, justified means declared righteous by God. How is it? By faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He made peace with God by the blood of His cross, Colossians 1 says. Look down in verse 10. 
if we, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Listen, He shed His blood, died for our sins, paid the price in full, rose from the dead, and now when we trust Him as our Savior, He not only takes away our sins, He gives us His righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. That's the greatest transaction. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's no peace on earth, but you as an individual sinner can have peace with God if you'll just trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. We're justified by faith without works. He did the work. We trust Him. We are justified the very moment we believe the gospel of the grace of God. The good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. He was delivered for our offenses, but raised again for our justification. Romans chapter 4 says at the end of the chapter. And so we have this peace with God. But not only that, once you receive that, then you can even enjoy the peace of God. Look in Philippians 4. Now, peace with God happens the moment you believe the gospel. Nothing can ever change that. But when you get saved, your flesh doesn't. You receive the Spirit of God, but you still got that old man, the flesh. And if you give place to that flesh, you won't enjoy the peace of God in your daily walk like you ought. The peace of God is the same peace God has. You think God's up there worried about what's going on in the world right now? Do you think He's all distraught about what's going to happen in the election? I mean, he, He's in total peace and He wants us to have that total peace. Jesus Christ said, My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. The world's peace is fake. And it does not last. The peace of God is real and lasting. But if you want to enjoy that in your daily walk, you need to look at this passage in Philippians 4 verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. No matter what's going on in this world, my rejoicing is in the Lord. He never changes. I have much to rejoice in daily, always, because of the Lord. And by the way, the end of verse 3 said, our names are in the book of life. That's something to rejoice in. I mean, we're, we have eternal life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. We're not to abuse this world. Let's live moderately. The Lord is at hand. That's what matters most. He's about to come. For, he's going to take the body of Christ out of here before He judges the world. It could be today. There are no signs for that. It could happen in a moment, and it will in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. 1 Corinthians 15. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. Don't be full of care, troubled and anxious and worried. No, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It's through Christ Jesus. It's not through a pill. It's not through a phony doctor. It's through Christ Jesus. You can have a peace that no substance or nothing in this world can give you. It comes from the Spirit of God, through the Word of God. And if your peace leaves you when you get in trouble, you're not walking in the peace of God. The peace of God keeps you. You don't have to keep it. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. Now, that verse right there proves you shouldn't watch CNN. Amen. I'm just saying. Amen. I mean, it's right there in the Bible. Now, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Think on them. Don't just give a passing thought to it, my friend. Meditate. Now, there's only a couple things I know for sure that fits the bill there. How about the Lord Jesus Christ? And the only thing you know about Him is revealed in the Holy Bible. So you better learn to meditate on the Word of God. You're going to lose your mind in this. This world is nuts. And you're going to lose your mind with everybody else if you don't stay in this book. The reason why people are so nutty today is because they don't care about the Word of God. They're leaving the Word of God, and so they, 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 they're going into insanity. I mean, come on. 
Look at where we're at. Get back to the Bible. Focus on the Lord and His salvation and the truth of God. Think on these things. The Bible said, Thou wilt keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Stayed on thee. If you spend more time watching the news and you do stuff, and I'm not against watching the news, y'all know what's going on, but if you spend more time in that stuff and you do this book, you're, you're going to be a mess. Thou wilt keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Isaiah 26, I believe it's verse 3. So he said, think on these things, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul our example in the age of grace. Do these things, he said, and the God of peace shall be with you. Now look, God is with me. He lives in me. I'm saved. But I want him to be with me in a real practical way in my daily walk. And, and if that's going to be the case, I'm going to have to rejoice in him. I'm, I'm going to have to be careful for nothing and choose to pray about everything instead of worrying about everything. I'm going to have to learn how to think right and live right. That's what he's teaching in the passage. This is conditional. The peace with God never changes. It's there the moment you believe on Christ. The peace of God depends on whether or not you're following what this passage says. It is conditional. Now, to say, and by the way, again, righteousness equals peace. What Paul's describing in Philippians 4 is living a righteous life. And that starts on the inside. You can't live right if your mind's not right. You've got to renew your mind in the Word of God. Paul said, be not conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That comes through the Word of God. Now, to say we're in chaotic and tumultuous times would be an understatement, wouldn't it? Who in the world knows what's going to happen between now and November 3rd? And not only that, what's going to happen after November 3rd? You know, asteroids supposed to hit the earth or something, isn't that? Right? The day before the election, isn't it? That's what they say. I don't know. I didn't look into that too much. But there's all kind of stuff, all kind of stuff going on. I'm not going to get into You know what's good. You know, you can see for yourself. I don't have to explain all that. But I know this. The body of Christ is not going through the tribulation. I ain't worried about the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, or any of that. I know it's coming. But the Lord's going to get us out of here first. But although we're not going through that prophesied tribulation, we still have tribulation. I mean, things could get pretty rough. Have you ever looked at church history and seen what God's people have had to go through down through the years? We've had it easy. That can change in a heartbeat. Quickly. But no matter what, no matter what, nothing going on around us should shake the peace we have within us. Because our peace is in Jesus Christ. Paul, a prisoner writes and says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And he said in the same passage in Philippians 4, he said, I've learned whatsoever state I am there with to be content. I, you know what? I'm not, my contentment is not based on who wins an election. <laughs> my peace is not based on the stock market. I don't have any stocks anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying, the stuff we base so, a lot of people they base they base their happiness on things going. On. You you look no, it's who lives within you. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the key. We have the sound words of Scripture which teach us sound doctrine, and when we believe the sound doctrine, we're going to have a sound mind. Paul told Timothy, God has not given us the spirit of fear but a power and a love and a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1.7 So I want to remind us of two basic things. I just got two points, not three, two. Two basic things that I think will help us maintain a proper balance in thinking about and dealing with what's going on today in our country. Very simple. Number one, this world is not our home. <laughs> Look in Philippians 3. Philippians 3. Now, it's easy to say that, something else to live like that. People act like, I mean, there are a lot, most professing Christians have their roots down in this world so much that I think some are going to be upset when the trumpet sounds. <laughs> I'm not ready to leave. Good night, folks. When the Lord comes, it's going to get a whole lot better. <laughs> Philippians 3.20, for our conversation is in heaven. Now, if you're saved... 
You've been baptized by one spirit and one body. You're a member of Christ. He's at the right hand of the Father. And Ephesians 2 teaches us that we're seated with Him in heavenly places. I'm so saved, and on my way to heaven, I'm already there. I'm not a schizophrenic. I'm just telling you, spiritually speaking, I'm already seated with Christ in heavenly. It's just a matter of time before my body catches up. I mean, I, I know I'm saved. I know I'm going to be glorified. There is no doubt about salvation and eternal security when you believe the Bible. It's clear. Our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior. That's who I'm looking for. I'm not looking for any man to fix anything. I'm looking for Christ to come. We look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. And the right view is in Philippians 4, the Lord is at hand. That means it's near. It could happen any moment. It could happen any day. I'm not looking for signs of the times. I'm not trying to look at current events and determine when Jesus is coming. I know He's coming. Every day my mindset and my heart is, Lord, could be today. I'm looking for that blessed hope. Paul never told us to look for the signs and for the Antichrist. All that's coming later. He told us to look for Christ from heaven. And so, my conversation is in heaven. Therefore, this world is not my home. I need to live each day in light of eternity. I need to live each day in light of the fact this is a temporal world. It's a fading world. It's not going to last. I'm going to leave it all behind. So I don't want my roots down here. Now, there are many things to distract us in this world. Many, many, many things. But we must determine in these days to stay focused on the Lord. We must keep our mind and heart set on the Lord Jesus Christ and our blessed hope. That is essential. Uh, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4.18, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, how do you look on things that aren't seen? Well, he explains later on in chapter 5, verse 7, when he said, We walk by faith, not by sight. I've got to base my life on the Word of God and walk by faith, knowing who the Lord is, who I am in Him, and that any moment He could come to catch me away and glorify me into His very image. And the, therefore, the right view is Colossians 3, verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand. I'll pause and let you catch up, and I'll take a drink of coffee, because I hear a bunch of pages. All right. It's only like two pages over where we were. <laughs> <laughs> verse 1 if you then be risen with and that's an if of argument not doubt in other words because we're risen with Christ seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God set your affection on things above not on things on the earth for you're dead and your life is hid with Christ and God when Christ who is our life shall appear then shall ye also appear with him in glory all right we have got to stay focused on the Lord and our blessed hope. And we've got to stay focused on keeping the main thing the main thing. Look over in 2 Corinthians 5. Here's the main thing. You know, why didn't the Lord just take us to heaven when He saved us? He left us in this sorry world to be an ambassador for Christ to tell people how they too can get saved out of this hell hole called planet Earth. That's why we're here, basically. All right? 2 Corinthians 5. Verse number 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Talking about the church, the body of Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. We're one new spiritual man. And all things are of God in this body of Christ. It's His work who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And so God has fixed it so that anybody, anywhere, no matter who they are and what they've done, they can be reconciled to Him through the death of His Son. What a message. He's not at war with the world right now. If you want to know what that's going to look like, read the book of Revelation. A tornado blowing through is not the judgment of God. Coronavirus is not the judgment of God. 
I mean, come on. There's a lot of things that are just are a part of living in a fallen world. You want to know what the judgment of God looks like? Read the book of Revelation, like I said. I mean, they ain't, uh, this stuff going on right now is nothing compared to what's coming. But we're here in a time of peace. Look at verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. All right, we're here as His representatives with His message. For, uh, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. Here is our invitation to this world. Be reconciled to God. For He hath made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Look in verse 1 of chapter 6. We then as workers together with Him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For He saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold... Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. In Revelation 6, it talks about the great day of His wrath. See, He's going to call His ambassadors home. That's called the rapture. Before He brings judgment on the world. The day of wrath is coming. Right now, it's the day of salvation. We need to know where we're living. And God's plan for the ages. And we're here to be His ambassadors. The Bible said God will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2.4. All right, so you know what, folks? We have the answer to the real problems. All right, everybody's caught up in the symptoms. The root problem is this is a fallen world. Men are lost sinners. We have the gospel of salvation by which souls can be saved eternally and God can change their life. And we need to keep the main thing the main thing. But we need to focus on the root issues. That's the gospel ministry. Folks, we have not been called to make the world a better place to go to hell from. It's not about social justice and civil rights and this, that, and the other. All that means nothing if you die and go to hell. And by the way, everybody's mistreated in this world at some point or another. Get over it. It's the way it is. We got to keep the main thing, the main. Everybody's pouting and crying. Look, folks, again, if you die lost, you're going to hell forever. So, you know, in light of that, it's hard to get distracted with all this nonsense going on. Let's keep it where it needs to be. Let's be ambassadors for Christ preaching the gospel. I've had people uh, email me and how come you don't address all these social issues? Because I got better things to do. You're not going to solve racism in a fallen world. Come on, man. <laughs> I had to do that. I'm sorry. <laughs> but really, you're not going to... Look, hey, you know what the answer is? If you get saved, you're in the body of Christ. It's neither Jew nor Gentile. You see, everything, the answer is in Jesus Christ. So we need to quit trying to convince people of our political persuasion and trying to do things socially. We need to get... Focus on preaching the gospel and teaching the Bible because that's what's going to make the difference. And if people don't want the truth, then you can't help them anyway. But you know what? We're here to fight the good fight of faith. The good fight. The good fight of faith. It's not the good fight of politics. It's the good fight of faith. And we must, and we talked about this last time we were in 2 Timothy, a good soldier does not get entangled with the affairs of this life. We can't get entangled with politics. We can't get entangled with social causes. We can't get entangled, by the way, with a bunch of conspiracies. Hey. Folks, I understand conspiracy is a real thing. It's, the word is found ten times in the King James Bible. There is a global conspiracy. I think Bill Gates is as evil as they come. Fauci included. The whole bunch of them. I think there's things going on that would blow our mind if we really understood all of it. So I understand that. But what am I going to do about it? <laughs> okay? In other words, I can't know everything there is to know about what's going on. And by the way, you say, how can all these countries and all these leaders, how can they all be on the same page? Because they have the same master. His name is Satan. He's the god of this world, the prince of this world. He's the master conspirator. He's preparing the way for his Christ, the man of sin, the son of perdition. Everything is headed that way. There are conspiracies, but we can't know it all and we can't do anything about it if we could know it all. And so, you know what? Just like with President Trump, there's, there's conspiracies on one extreme to the other. Some people think he's a savior. Others think he's an antichrist. I just think he's a businessman from New York who's trying to help his country. I haven't seen proof of more than that. 
you know, so I just got to go with that. <laughs> I mean, nobody, I've listened to people. Nobody, I've heard it from both sides. Nobody's proved anything to me. A bunch of speculation, a bunch of innuendos, a bunch of what-ifs. I don't got time for that. I mean, look, he's not the answer, and he's not the problem, okay? Let's not forget who the real enemy is. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. I don't think Trump's the Savior. I don't think he's the Antichrist either. Now, I've seen it, and I'm, not, I'm just trying to be an encouragement it, for those who are into this, I, I know a lot of people right now, they're all worked up, they're all distraught because they sit online investigating everything. And QAnon and this and that. I, you can do that if you want, but uh, you, what are you going to do? At the end of the day, what, is, what are you going to do? I'm not saying ignore reality. I'm not saying deny. There are conspiracies. There ain't no doubt about that to me. I don't think it's a theory. <laughs> conspiracy theory is conspiracy fact. But I got this Bible right here, and I'm told to think on these things. Paul said, be simple concerning evil, and wise concerning that which is good. There is evil in this world, but if that's all you think about, you're going to be a miserable wretch. We've got, accept it, realize it, don't ignore it, don't stick your head in the sand, but don't focus on it. You know what? I mean, it's amazing the things people are getting hung up on today. I mean, I had a man in my office, it wasn't that long ago. He was, and, oh, I mean, it was when we were in the old building. And he never came to church. He just wanted some counseling, and I tried to help him. He was so distraught. But the whole time he was in my office, he was trying to convince me we didn't go to the moon. And I tried to tell him, I don't care. I don't care if we did or not. So what? So they're lying. What else is new? <laughs> I'm saying, look here, let me show you something here. No, no, I'm here to convince. No, I said, no, that's why you're so messed up. I didn't, I didn't ask you to come to counsel me. You're the one sitting there all messed up. I'm the one sitting here with the peace of God. Why don't you listen to what I got to say? And he never came to church, but... The fact is, is people, some people, I, you know what I think? I think some people are so miserable that they want a distraction. And they want to look at how messed up the world is so they don't have to think of how messed up they are. But the better thing is to think on the Lord. Don't get, okay, if we didn't go to the moon, fine. If 9-11 if was an inside job, okay. But let's get back to the Bible. Okay, don't get hung up on that, right? Loch Ness Monster? Sasquatch? I mean, if, if you're interested in that, that's, that's one thing. If it becomes your obsession, if you're obsessed about what shape the earth is, what are you talking about? Who cares? I don't care if it's a pyramid. I don't care if it's a rectangle. I don't, hey, I'm seated in heavenly places. Okay? Good night, folks. Look at the fruits of that stuff. Paul, uh, listen, there's a verse. It's in Hebrews. Paul didn't write Hebrews. <laughs> but Hebrews 13 said, Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. Carried about. It's a good thing for the heart to be established with grace. All right, number two. Number two. Last point. <laughs> First point, this world is not our home. Secondly, but while we're here, we still have some earthly responsibilities. Look in Titus chapter 3. Trying to balance things out here with the Word of God. I'm, I'm thinking that when the rapture hits and I'm looking back and I see that globe, I'm going to say, Told you! <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. I don't, it's not an issue of fellowship with me. I don't get it. You can believe whatever you want. Earth is on a turtle. Atlas is holding it up, so on, so on, so forth. I'm just kidding, folks. Don't get all upset, you know. Sir, I'm going to get an email on this one. I just, I, I, I'm just saying, regardless of all of that, we've got to keep the main thing. The main, that's all I'm saying. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. And, and this good work here in the context of our responsibility toward human government. To speak evil of no man, 
I never read that verse when Obama was president. Never read it. I just overlooked it. <laughs> to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves were... And, and by the way, let me, let me say this for all the Trump haters out there that want to tell us that he's a sinner. Really? Can you imagine how harsh sinners are on pointing out Trump's sins? Let him without sin cast the first stone. Why don't you remember this? We ourselves also are sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. <laughs> That's how we all are, man. Fle hey, Trump's flesh ain't any worse than yours, you self-righteous hypocrite. Get off your high horse. I mean, and honestly, same with all of them. Hillary, Pelosi, I don't know. I don't even think Pelosi has a soul, to be honest with you. I mean, something there that's just too creepy. But... You know, the thing about it is we've got to remember we're only saved by God's grace, you know. We've always got to keep that in mind. And he goes on to talk about how we're saved by grace. But here's the thing. Uh, there, you know, people say, you're so heavenly minded, you're of no earthly good. Well, that's ridiculous. The fact is we can't be much earthly good until we get heavenly minded. So this world's not our home. We're a heavenly people. But while we're here... The same apostle who tells us all about our heavenly position also instructs us how to live on earth. For an example, he said we're all one. In Christ, there's neither male nor female. Spiritually speaking, we're in one body. And yet he tells wives to submit to their husbands. He tells servants to obey their masters. There's still earthly distinctions while we're here. And we still got to honor and obey human government. While we're here. And so, earthly responsibilities, and I'm going to just focus in here in our, at the end of this message on, in particular, human government, our civic responsibilities. You know what? Uh, we, we should know and we should use our rights as American citizens. Paul is our example. He knew and used his Roman rights as a citizen of Rome. Check it in the book of Acts. He does it a number of times. And so, you know, we should be thankful that we live in this country. You know, our Constitution is not infallible. It's not inspired of God. But it's, it's the best document by which a government should be run in this world. Okay? And so I think we, we have... It's a great privilege to be an American uh, as it pertains to our freedoms, as it pertains to a number of things. And so I want to know my rights and I want to use those rights and I don't want to give them up easily. We have an opportunity. One of our rights is we have an opportunity to be involved in electing our leaders. Why wouldn't we use that opportunity? You say, well, it's all or nothing. I'm waiting for the right one to come along. Well, you're, going, you're never going to vote for anybody then because there will never be a candidate you totally agree with. But if you don't vote at all, you actually help the worst one get in. There's different ways of looking at it. And if in your conscience you can't bring yourself to vote, then don't. That's your prerogative. But it's a good work. It's what our government asks us to do. I guarantee you Paul would have done it if he had an opportunity to be involved with trying to uh, elect someone who was going to be a help to the um, gospel ministry, right? So I think at the, the bottom line is we should vote for those whose policies line up closest with what the Bible teaches about the role of human government. We saw it in our scripture reading. Romans 13, very clear. It's very simple. Government is here to protect the good and punish the evil. Okay? It's not here to run our life. It's not here to provide for us and be our God. We have a God, thank you. Okay? So, we understand. And by the way, it's not unconditional sub submission. We, we taught on this not long ago. When, when government gets out of bounds from what God intended it to be, we're not obligated to obey government. That's why we, we could care less as a church what the government says about whether we can meet or not. It's not their business. <laughs> at all. And a lot of churches catered into that, and look what's happened. You give them an inch, to take a mile, man. So no, no, it's not unconditional submission. We know what the, the role of government is. 
And I'm just saying this, this election, please have some wisdom and discernment. Don't make it about personality. That's childish. It's not about personality. It's not about leadership style. It's about policy. Okay? It's about the, what's going to be done by these administrations that are going to affect our life. You know what the real issues are? I'm summing it up. The real issues are these. First of all, it's a choice between liberty and bondage. And you can read the platforms, Republican platform, Democrat platform. I, you know, I don't fully agree with any in government. I'm not fully supporting anybody. I'm just saying when you look at their platforms, though, there's a clear-cut difference. But, by the way, you've you got to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis because there are some Republicans in name only, right? And there have been actually some Democrats that have bucked the system. I mean, you've got to look at it case by case. But, as a whole, liberty versus bondage. It's about the First Amendment. It's about freedom of speech. The coronavirus has revealed a whole lot that was already there. Look at the difference in terms of control and choices. Right? Look at it. I, there's a lot I can say right there. But here's the deal. The most important issue to a Bible-believing Christian is the freedom to get the gospel out. Right? So if I got a party that would love to see our church stay shut down, I ain't voting for that. Right? And folks, make no mistake about it, that, they're headed, that, that's, they, they hate what we believe. They're against what we believe. They would love nothing more than to shut us down permanently. You can listen to what they say and see that. And then there's the difference between life and death. One party said, we believe in the importance and sanctity of human life. Uh, one party says, let's kill unborn babies in their mother's womb. And even after they're born. How any Christian could vote for someone who supports abortion is beyond me. Beyond me. People say, well, you know, there's other issues. You know, Trump's mean for an example. <laughs> I'm serious. I heard that. I heard that. Last night I was listening to a preacher, not a preacher, an attorney who's a Christian, say, you know what, it's not just about the abortion thing. Look how cruel Trump is. That's not, he, he ain't nothing, I mean, cruel? Let's talk about cruel. Come on, folks, there's no comparison there between his tweets and killing babies. If I was in his shoes, I'd probably be killing everybody by now. Talking about cruel. I can't imagine the pressure and what's going on. So let's not, let's not judge until we're in his shoes. But then the, how about this? Liberty versus bondage, life versus death, decency versus deviancy. Marriage is foundational to society. When you want to say there's 27 genders... And, and by the way, it's not just the same-sex garbage. It's going the way of, of pedophiles and bestiality. It's going to be an onslaught of deviancy and perversion and filthiness. I heard a preacher say, if you read Romans chapter 1 about this evil world, you'll think you're reading the Democrat platform. That's how messed up it is. All you got to do is read it. Moral issues are highly important. All right? Nationalism versus globalism. That's God's plan versus Satan's. Christ will bring in a kingdom. In the meantime, He wants nations divided. He wants nations to be nations. Read it in Genesis 10 and 11. God determined the nations and told them to spread out and to be nations. It was Satan's antichrist, Nimrod, who's a type of the antichrist to come, who brought in a one world religion and a one world government and a, world, a one world economy. Satan is the one who weakens the nations, according to Isaiah 14. And so God's plan is nations. Satan's plan is globalism. There's the difference in the election right there. Law and order versus anarchy. Now, there's a lot to say there, but I'm going to tell you this. The Second Amendment's a big deal. And as we're getting crazier and crazier in this country, I'm locked and loaded. I, don't want, I want to have my guns. And if you don't got one, get one. 
And if people want to come on the street and try to uh, raise cane and whatever, you better be able to, it, it is right, it is good for a man to protect his family, and if you don't, you're worse than an infidel. All right, what about capitalism versus socialism? Paul said, if a man won't work, neither should he eat. Now, people say, hey, if you're a capitalist, they say, oh, you just love money. No, no, no. It's about responsibility. It's about, hey, I'm responsible for my own family. I don't need the government taking care of me. And if you study, and I don't have time to get into this, uh, in this present age, capitalism is more biblical. Socialism will not work. It has failed every time. It is, it is, it is a disaster, and there's so many evil things that go along with it. But that's my last point. The economy is not the biggest thing to me. Again, life, uh, liberty versus bondage, life versus death, decency versus deviancy, nationalism versus globalism, law and order versus anarchy, capitalism versus socialism. That kind of sums it up, doesn't it? Now, what about Trump's character? What about the fact that he has failed as, uh, morally? We're not voting for a spiritual leader. We're voting for a president and again, it's amazing how sinners are so harsh to judge Trump for being a sinner. But you know what? What has he done since he's been in the office? Nobody has ever in the history of the United States been investigated more than him. I guarantee you that. And the best they can come up with as far as corruption is him warning the president of Ukraine about corruption from the other candidate, <laughs> which he actually did. <laughs> Folks, can you imagine if they spent 10 minutes on the Biden family or the Clinton family, if they spent any amount of investigation in a real way, what they would uncover? You ought to look at the fact the man was being investigated before he even got the, the presidency, and they hadn't come up with nothing. That's, that's pretty impressive. You say, well, he was a, an adulterer. Uh, yeah, but not in the Oval Office. But what I'm saying is all these politicians... I don't even want to know <laughs> the filth. But since he's been there, he seems to have some think, and I've known some people who said they really think he got saved. I hope he did. Say, so, well, if he did, he wouldn't cuss. Oh, come on. I'm glad you're not around me when my mower breaks. <laughs> but come on, folks, really. I'm not saying it's good. You shouldn't curse. I understand that. But come on. What, you're a sinner, too. Now, come on, really. It's amazing. Why in the world? I've never seen anything like it. How judgmental. People, and people talk about not being judgmental, but they think they have every right to just condemn this man. I, I think a real thing is, is, you know, a lot of beta males just can't stand an alpha male. That's what I really think. I mean, God forbid we have a president that actually acts like a man. I don't want a president gets up and apologizes for everything he says and does. I mean, good night. He needs to lead. But the thing, you know, Trump said he was a Presbyterian, right? But yet, he just come out and said, I no longer consider myself that. I'm a non-denominational Christian. He just said that. And I know a pastor who preached the gospel at his brother's funeral. And he said the Trump family was extremely receptive to it and said they appreciated and agreed with what was said. An independent Baptist pastor preached. He had a part in Trump's brother's funeral. Okay, so I'm just saying, you never know. Hey, what about his past? You know what? What about your past? You, you want us to do an investigation? Don't look in my past. It's all under the blood. The man is not called to be our spiritual leader. He's called to protect the good and punish the evil. And if he's going to be a friend of the church instead of a foe of the church, that's who we need in there. Well, I'll just say in conclusion, <laughs> and I'm not even going to turn to these passages. I'm done. Pray for your leaders. 1 Timothy 2, pray for your leaders. Not only don't speak evil against them, make intercession for them. Paul talks about prayer for those in authority, and he talks about in terms of the gospel ministry, the main thing is people get saved and learn the truth, and we ought to pray much to that end, that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. We need leaders who will stay out of our way and let us be the church. And then, lastly... Let's make sure we're working out our own salvation. 
In Philippians 2, Paul talks about working out our own set. We, we're saved by grace, but we need to work out what God's put in, and we need to shine as lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Let's not get so focused on attacking the nation that we fail to live out our own faith. I still contend the biggest problem in America is in the church. In the homes. Families not being families. Churches not being churches. That would solve a lot if we could get all that worked out. But at the end of the day, folks, no man can fix this present evil world. You can picture it like this. There's a train going over the cliff. There are some people who want to get in it and slow it down. But there are others who want to get in and put the pedal to the metal. <laughs> By the way, the, demo, look, the, the, the globalist agenda is to destroy America so we can become part of the global system. When Trump went to the UN and said the future belongs to patriots, not globalists, and we are nationalists, not global, I mean, it was on. <laughs> he, it, and, and, and the economy must be destroyed. America's sovereignty as a nation must be destroyed because we're the greatest nation on planet Earth and if we, we're we standing in the way of that agenda. So for my family's sake, I'd like to see this train slow down a little bit. <laughs> I know we're living in a mystery age that interrupted prophecy, but the stage is being set. Paul said the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Everything's headed toward the tribulation period. We'll get out of here first, but things are still headed that way. And the reality is America will be destroyed. It's not even a player in the last days. It's not even a player in the tribulation as far as I can tell in prophecy. Can you imagine what's going to happen in this nation when the rapture happens? So the worst is yet to come for this world. But if you're saved, the best is yet to come for us. And either way, we're on the winning side. But don't you think we ought to have a sense of urgency about the work of the ministry? Keeping the main thing the main thing? Life is short. Time is short. The Lord's coming. We can't get hung up on secondary things and lesser things. We've got to stay focused. And again, at the end of the day, no matter what happens, no matter who wins, no matter any of that, I still have the peace of God. And you know what? If, if all hell breaks loose, you know, as we head up to the election and after the election... I, you know, it is what it is. We just got to trust the Lord and keep going. I'm not going to let this stuff destroy my peace. But at the same time, I'm not going to stick my head in the sand. I can vote. I can play some part. I can pray. I can be a good citizen. I can do some things for my family's sake. And that's what we need to do. Let's stand together, please.